My name is Mark Gollidge. Um, I lead our programme of work at the LGA, um, focusing around digital and data across health and social care. Um, so this sort of discussion um, is going to obviously be around covering data sharing across health and social care, um, jointly with David. Do you want to introduce yourself, David? Yeah, I'm David Evans. I spoke before for those of you who didn't run off. Um, I'm currently with NHS Digital, previously with the Information Commissioner's Office for about 13 years, all over every aspect of data protection and freedom of information, and in about two weeks going to clear off and join NHS England. So, Great. Kind of fluid. Um, so I'm sort of going to give you a bit of an overview around some of the things that um, uh, to bear in mind, touching on actually some of the questions that we talked about earlier. Um, David's going to chip in um, anything that I get wrong. Um, David's going to correct me. Um, but also um, David, no doubt, will feed in sort of extra thoughts and ideas sort of as we go through. I've been with the LJ for three years. Um, we work, as most of you are probably aware, work quite closely with local authorities around health and social care. Um, originally started out um, about three years ago working with what was then the Integrated Care Pioneers, um, focusing around data sharing um, and have done a range of different things around data sharing and uh, particularly working quite closely with NHS England and NHS Digital um, on a number of things that are underway. Wanted to cover a few things, one around um, GDPR and Data Protection Bill. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there because you, you I'll just be um, going over old ground that you've already heard today. Um, we do want to touch a, a bit around the common law duty of confidentiality. Um, we did touch on that a little bit earlier. Um, and then the interface there with consent. And then I'm going to touch a little bit around the two areas at the bottom, the one around the Caldecott standards um, and the new IG toolkit coming from April called the Data Protection and Security Toolkit. Um, and then touch on the opt-out module that, again, um, David mentioned earlier on today. So they're the sort of things that we want to run through um, and obviously feel free to chip in um, as we go. So in terms of um, GDPR and the Data Protection Bill, um, these are going to be things that you're already aware of for those of you um, involved at a local level. Um, so obviously for GDPR, recognising and making sure that processing is fair, lawful and transparent. Um, making sure that, uh, that organisations are obviously establishing, recording and informing subjects. Um, and obviously, as you would have heard earlier, making sure that there's an Article 6 um, and an Article 9 condition that's satisfied under the GDPR for processing that data. So I'm not going to go over those things because you would have heard a lot of that today. Um, the one thing that we do want to touch on is that um, when we're talking around um, processing data, sharing data across health and social care, um, and also within social care, it's important to make sure that we touch on and you're, we're aware of the common law duty of confidentiality or common law duty of confidence. Um, and we'll come back to this sort of in a second. So from a GDPR perspective, these will hopefully be things that you're familiar with. Obviously, the Article 9 condition under special categories um, does now include social care. Um, so it's not just sort of um, processing under, for medical purposes, but it does incorporate sort of health and social care um, much more broadly. So these, um, from a social care perspective, may be um, some of the areas that you may be relying on um, when it comes to processing. Um, a number of different ones there. We've already heard this morning around the challenges around um, processing for con on a con um, using consent. Um, and no doubt some of you will be using other um, functions or other um, uh, elements that are, that are supported there. Um, so a number, of th a number of areas that you can rely on for processing under GDPR. Um, obviously the challenges around consent that we're going to talk through in a second. And then from a um, data protection bill um, perspective, um, it highlights obviously that um, uh, it's around processing um, under the responsibility of a health um, professional or a social work professional um, uh, and obviously as part of those um, requirements for professionals that they have um, a reg reg that registration and uh, requirements there but also, um, also another person who's in the circumstances owes a duty of confidentiality. So there's an inherent sort of role there around um, processing that's carried out by professionals and having that duty of confidence, um, having that duty of confidentiality um, within there. And of course, social workers um, regulated by the Health and uh, Care Professions Council that do have codes of practice in place around that. 
So we've got processing under GDPR. We also need to be, bear, be mindful around the common law duty of confidence. Now, if you're a local authority, how many local authorities would have, have been sort of relying on c explicit consent previously for processing under DPA, largely around social care? Very few. Okay, interesting. Um, so um, a number of um, local authorities we know have been um, using explicit consent previously um, for processing under the Data Protection Act. Um, now looking at um, uh, now looking at what um, to rely on when it comes to GDPR, um, and needing to think through if you're not relying on consent um, under GDPR, that then automatically brings in um, the common law duty of confidence. So not only do you need to be considering um, how do we meet the requirements of the GDPR, you also need to be thinking through um, this the, the common law duty of confidence, which isn't a specific law um, in the sense of a written down law it's um, obviously been developed by case law um, and other different um, and other elements sort of as part of that so for local authorities you need to ensure that you meet both GDPR um, and the common law duty of confidence um, and consent when we talk about consent consent is the definition of consent is different under GDPR versus consent under under common law so as um, Laurie from Essex this morning talked about um, when we, we had the question about consent. Essex aren't processing under GDPR using consent. They're going to rely on um, some of the other or one of the other um, elements that I highlighted earlier. But they are going to be um, capturing consent from individuals um, to meet the common law duty of confidence. So you need to be mindful around meeting both GDPR and common law duty of confidence um, when looking at those things. So um, consent, as it says up there, may be obtained for confidentiality, um, not needed for GDPR. Um, so worth considering that as you walk through. Just, just yep. You know, one further point to make: you, however you deal with the common law duty of confidence, you must deal with it. So you must get the individual consent, albeit for the common law duty of confidence, or you must have a legal basis that would allow you to use that patient's uh, recipient of care, their information, um, without their consent. Because if you don't, and this is where the trap shuts, you haven't got a lawful basis for processing, you fall foul of the Data Protection Act. And falling foul of the Data Protection Act is more troublesome because, of course, there's an active regulator in the area. And if you go and look at the um, Fun and Games, uh, which was 2016, last year, 2016, the Royal Free Hospital, this is where they dumped a load of data into Google. One of the criticisms, severe criticisms from the ICO was actually the information was confidential. You didn't have a legal basis to process that confidential information, and therefore you fell foul of the Data Protection Act and currently the first principle because you didn't have that lawful basis. So you have to navigate the common law duty of confidence one way or the other. So when someone's consenting under the common law duty of confidentiality, yeah. what are they consenting to? Whatever you've explained to them. Right. Because bas basically common law duty of confidence is where there is a duty of confidence, what is their expectation? And stroke at the other end of it, no surprises. Mm. So if they're getting treatment from their GP who wants to evolve the care and he says so, that's expectation, that's direct care, that's fine. But if that data is then going to be shoveled off and given to Google, given elsewhere, would the person expect that? So um, it, is, it, is, it is not a, um, a strictly le like statute legal test. It is judgment and it is that justification I talked about this morning. So is the requirement to actually state it? You are, the In terms of the evidence it, base. Was it just that you can say they acknowledge that this is happening? I would, I would suggest you go as far as, even for the common law duty of confidence, you record that consent. So this, was, this, this was explained, this is what they said, or this is what they accepted. Because then that's your evidence, even if you then go on to the GDPR and you rely on other conditions, that's your evidence you, in this case, sought the consent of the individual. Mm. And maybe you have a legal basis to process anyway. Mm. I was thinking, because obviously with social care clients, it can be quite um, not the best relationship. So therefore, if they're given the option to withdraw consent for something, they may do so. And, well, and if that, you're telling uh, them they've got consent, then they've got... Okay, that, then that depends. And Mark will know better than I do. Depending on the circumstances, you will find actually you have a, a legal right, obligation, duty to do it anyway, whether they consent or not. Mm. So if you've got that, don't bother asking for consent. That's actually misleading. Yeah. But it's where, the, where you're offering them a genuine choice. 
you need, that's where you need to square it off. If you've got a legal power that says, we as X, Y, Z, local authority are going to do this to you, like it's a lump it, then you don't need the cons you've got that legal basis. And that's why, so if we look at consent under GDPR, that's why you probably aren't going to be relying on consent under GDPR. I'll come back in a second. Um, because there's that imbalance of power, i.e. there aren't, there, aren't there aren't alternatives in terms of processing. So you as a local authority to provide that service to an individual, you need to do that. If, if you're relying on consent and that person says, no, I don't give my consent, then all of these other things then come into effect. Um, and there is that imbalance of power. So um, uh, you probably don't want to be relying on consent for, to meet GDPR purposes, but you do need to think through how you overcome the conf common law duty of confidence. But, um, but, but where you don't have a, an alternative legal basis. Yeah. So some, some of the local authorities, you want to say you will have powers to do things, then you don't need to consent. You know to tell them what you're going to do, mm. but you don't need the consent. But other times, you want to offer them a service, you will need their consent. Yeah. And if they say no, end of show. Is it the same though? Sorry, I'm sort of confused now. Yeah. Because the slide before then, if I'm going to consent for whatever reason, I would ask those questions, I'll make sure that was fair. So where's the difference between common law as such and GDPR? Because GDPR is for that and it has to be unambiguous now, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Is it not the unambiguous? No, the other, the, other thing with the, with the other thing with the GDPR is, and it's something Chris Pounder touched on this morning, the view of the Article 29 European group is actually, given the relationship between a public authority and an individual, yeah. there is no equality of arms, there's no fairness in that relationship. Public authorities generally have the powers, and the individual is going to get corralled, or not all the time, but most of the time. And therefore, the, the advice out of Europe is if you're a public authority, don't look to rely on consent. That's in terms of the GDPR. Yeah. So, that still leaves in this country, though, where, where you're dealing with confidential circumstances, e.g. delivery of care. You still have to nav navigate the common law duty of confidence as a separate exercise. But if you don't do that navigation and uh, clear the common law duty of confidence, then you've got an issue around the data protection compliance, GDPR compliance, in terms of lawful basis. But on the I think six and nine come yeah. through, they yeah. say if you have a lawful basis, authority yeah. or whatever, you can do that. And then the nine it says it's a medical law, yeah. so look after the individual, yeah. that's covered in GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. So if you need consent, it has to be outside of that boundary. So where's the common law consent come in? That, 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 that's, the, that's the consent. Either you have a legal basis that navigates common law consent or common law duty of confidence. So you have a, a, a duty or to deliver services. Or you have to seek, you have to actually engage the individual because they have a choice. So once you've you made that choice, <laughs> yeah. It's so what, what it is. Anything. What it is though with the GDPR. If you rely on GDPR consent, then that individual has more powerful rights, account of, um, portability, right to be forgotten. Take if we take a practical example. So you've got a social worker that's providing support to an individual, um, and you need to process that information as a local authority. Um, you can. You obviously need to meet the GDPR requirements. Um, um, and you can, if you want to, um, use consent, but there's challenges for the reasons that we've talked through already, so you'll probably be relying, as you talked about, in terms of the med you know, medical or social care purpose. Um, that, so that's been sort of met from that perspective, but the social worker, just taking this off, has a, um, has a duty of confidence in terms of how that information is used and shared, as, of, as with a GP, if you go and view a, see a GP, a GP, you know, you might have met the GDPR requirements to share, um, but a GP still has a duty of confidence to you as an, in, as an individual or a social worker. So if you read through the codes of ethics for social workers or for GPs, it says that they have a duty of confidence. So as well as meeting GDPR, you need to ensure, as a social worker or a GP, that if you're going to share that information, that you've met the expectations of that individual. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an ex it's an, yeah, it's an, and it's an additional thing on top of GDPR. So what we tend to find for health is that they will, where it's about sharing within the individual direct direct care team, they'll often rely on implied consent, i.e. they don't tell the person because it's their reasonable expectations that information would be shared. Um, um, what we're seeing a number of local authorities doing are saying, well, actually, we've captured consent before. 
we're not we're going to update our um our um transparency and um uh, notices to be saying that we're not going to be capturing that under gdpr but we're going to be using capturing the person's consent to meet the extra additions of common law duty of confidence so it is it is quite confusing i think the main takeaway is probably bear in mind that you've got both gdpr and common law you're probably going to want to get capture consent but capture it for common law not for GDPR. Um, can I just, um, in terms of a summary, I want to depict this using a flow chart. Yeah. Are we saying there are three um, provisions for uh, processing information? On the one hand, there's a statutory provision, sorry, which is GDPR. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, there is consent for fringe um, processing. And on the third hand, Common law duty of no, I would uh, no GDPR and common law. Yeah, and I would what I would do in terms of tackling it is to tackle the common law first, which is the common law duty of confidence. So you have, have either have that legal basis, or you have that consent which is given. And once you tick that box, then you move on to satisfying the GDPR requirements, which Mark's already set out. On the basis, if you can't tick the common law box then there's no point in moving on to GDPR because you shouldn't be doing it because you haven't got a legal basis to do it. Yeah. Yes. So it goes in that order. So if you're looking at... Yeah. Just, sorry, so um, just to get this straight, so the um, common law... We are law trying to confuse you all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, basically for sharing, which is, uh, you know, is not within, it's not reasonably expected. So where, obviously, the um, data subject would not reasonably expect to share, that's where you would... You so, so you get the consent or, or, or has something that says you can do it anyway. Yeah, so common, the, common law, um, the common law is developed by case law. It involves any sharing that relates to um, an individual where there might be, where that professional might have a duty of confidence to that individual. And um, it can be, um, common law can be about sharing with a direct care team where it's expected, or it could equally be about areas that it's not reasonably expected. Um, so as this slide shows there's under common law there's generally two types of consent that you will be looking at one is which is what i've talked about which is what health tend to rely on which is implied consent so you go to a gp gp refers you to a hospital the gp doesn't ask you whether it's okay for that information to be shared because it's a reasonable expectation that that would happen or that's no longer that's no longer going to be valid is it implied consent. under common law it common will law. yes no. It's never been valid under the data protection. No. So under to meet assuming let's assume that you've met all the GDPR bits, you still have to overcome common law. You could say, well, actually, I'm sharing my social workers' information um, with, um, or sorry, I'm sharing this professional's inf this person's information within the direct care team, and it's for their direct care and it's reasonably expected that information would be shared. You don't need to ha get explicit consent if you don't want to um, on that. Um, but there might be areas where you want to um, share information um, that is identifiable, that does need to um, um, address this sort of common law area. Um, hence, you'll be looking at um, getting explicit, explicit consent, to, consent to share that information. So, Aisha, for example, and this is how I understand it. Yeah. So, say you have a client who needs social care services. So, you will be providing them home care services because they need home care services. Yeah. That's where you've got implied consent. And yeah. then you offer them, say, look, I'm going to be contacting voluntary agencies who yeah. will give you other services that aren't via social services. Yeah. That will be explicit consent because then you'll be saying to them, yeah. do you want me to contact these people for you? Yeah. yeah, and it might just be easier. I mean, like Essex are doing. Essex are just yeah. saying, well, actually, we're going to get con we've already been getting consent. We're just going to get consent anyway. Yeah. Um, it enables us to do these things and keep it quite straightforward from that basis. So under GDPR, there's <coughs> management of healthcare systems yeah. and services. Yeah, it's one ninety-two H. Yeah. So that's where we've been thinking about our business intelligence function. Yeah. So under common law duty, where would that, where would something like that sit? Because the implied consent would be on the healthcare team, that's direct care, that's fine. Yeah. But under government guidance, direct care does include social uh, kind of management of those services and systems. I'd include business intelligence as being one of those things to help you run and manage your services and systems. So would you need explicit consent for business intelligence or would you need, or would you be able to run on implied consent? And that's kind of, you know, the reality is, is under identifiable data. 
uh, first argument is essentially you, know, you could pseudo normalize it and other t techniques, but essentially people are going to want to see patient client level data. David? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer it if it's about sharing outside of the organisation. No, it's, it, the, the <coughs> it's goes to the whole issue of reasonable expectations. Yeah, and I'm thinking with the, with the healthcare it's, it, and around the, the, the cold cold outcomes. So it's where that information is being used to support the service delivery and develop it and audit it and account for it. But if you then want to go beyond that and do more in-depth research into certain areas, that's when you're probably staying beyond the bounds of reasonable expectation. So it's that, it's, it's that reasonable expectation. So, you know, what would your receiver of care, your patient, yeah. your, your citizen, what would they expect? Yeah. Our job as DPOs to step in and go, well, as a BI team or yeah. managers, yeah. Yeah. or take an anonymous data, take an aggregate data, yeah. and yeah. You yeah. Drive, drive that yeah. as far yeah. as possible. Yeah. 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 And that's where the judgment's going to come in, because... Yeah, it will. Yeah. Yeah, and if you read, and this is where the Caldecott reports come in, so the Caldecott reports are largely around common law, and I think the first or second Caldecott report, they talk about direct care and talk about what the direct care team might mean, um, and talk about sort of not just the registered and regulated, but it could be one step, one person that's removed from that, so I encourage you to have a read of that, but you, you're right, this is where you sort of need to you know, you'll need to take a view as a local authority around what is what, what is in the reasonable expectations of individuals for that information to be shared. And again, if you're transparent with individuals and you're saying, telling them about what's being shared, actually that will help to, you know, address some of those reasonable expectations. There are three other, um, without wanting to confuse things even further, um, there are three other areas um, <laughs> which I'll just briefly touch on the first two. So if you haven't got implied consent and you haven't got explicit consent, you can apply under the um, NHS 2006 Act um, to something called Section 251, which basically enables the Secretary of State um, to set aside that common law duty of confidence. So there's a number of mainly used for health, I think, David. It's a health, yeah. It's, um, basically, it's, it's actually a health focus in Section 251. No, it does not include social care. It does now include yes, now. Yes. It does. It does. Yeah. So health and social care. But that's it. Because I have seen other applications. And why? Because the applications are made to a group called the Confidentiality Advisory Group, which is hosted by the Health Research Authority. Once upon a time, I provided data protection advice to them. Um, and what they do is that's a bunch of experts and lay members. So experts in medical, legal, ethical, um, plus the lay members who actually assess whether um, an application um, is, is suitable for having the common law duty of confidence <coughs> lifted. If they think it is, they will support the use of Section 251, support the lifting of the common law duty of confidence, and either the Secretary of State for Health or the Health Research Authority, where it's a health research-based request, can then lift, have the power to lift the common law duty of confidence. But they make it hard work, because it's basically should be very small amount of applications yeah. and time limited and focused. Yeah. It's mainly research based, yeah. um, mainly research applications. Tower oh, Hamlets yeah. Council have just um, yeah. gone through um, Section 251. Um, so you've got Section 251. The other thing, um, and worth me highlighting this, is that there is also um, an option for NHS Digital to collect information under, under something called a direction. Now we're working at the moment with three local authorities, um, Liverpool, Rochdale and Manchester, to enable client level social care data to flow into NHS Digital um, and for that data to be processed, linked with health data and then flow back out for population health and a business intelligence sort of activity. So there's a direction that um, David's been working on um, and linked into that enables that information to flow from those local authorities into NHS Digital to be linked and flow back out. So if you're sitting there thinking, one of the things that we need to do is to be linking health and social care data across our system to get an understanding around how people are um, interacting across the whole system, um, then that's the work that um, Manchester, Liverpool and Rochdale have been doing under that. So there are yeah. options to set aside the common law if you haven't got implied consent or explicit consent. Um, just a few other things to mention. Um, so about six months ago, um, the Department of Health issued its response to Dame Fiona's report on um, introducing a... Yeah. 
data security um, set of standards and a new consent model. Because it took a year um, to do that. Yeah, it did take a year for them to do that. Um, so the, the reports out there um, encourage you to have a look through. The main thing to note is that if you're completing or your local authority is completing the IG toolkit, from April that's going to change and it will become the data security and protection toolkit. There's currently work that's underway on that at the moment to refine it and reshape it um, and encourage you to have a look through. I mentioned earlier a new publication from the Department of Health that came out, uh, was updated last week. It talks about local authorities and what the impact on local authorities is of the new IG toolkit that's in there. What we're trying to do is make sure that for those local authorities that are doing ISO accreditation, PSN, Code of Connection, IG toolkit, that there's some streamlining across. So actually there's not a whole load of duplication for local authorities um, between these different things. So encourage you to have a look at that. Um, and then the other thing that David mentioned briefly um, today um, is that there is, um, uh, as part of that review that Dame Fiona prepared, um, uh, there was proposed um, a opt-out model. So this is an opt-out that enables people to opt out of their personal and confidential data being used beyond direct care. Now, obviously, there's not an opt-out under GDPR. This is opting out under common law just to make things even more complicated. So this is about um, opting out of around um, a common law duty of confidentiality. So from May, the public will be able to register an opt-out um, of their personal confidential information used beyond direct care. Um, and then it's digital are currently working through what that looks like, but will probably be online and in paper. So everyone in the country will be given an opportunity if they want to, to opt out of that data being used. Um, I imagine that because it's personal and confidential, i.e. you can identify the individual and it's beyond direct care, the purposes are going to be relatively small. Um, between May and May 18 and May 2020, or through to 2020, the opt-outs will be applied to the data. So even from May, people will be able to the option to opt out. It's not actually going to be fully implemented straight away. That's going to happen over the next couple of years. Um, one of the things we're trying to work through at the moment is are there impacts of that data on local authorities? So um, people are registering an opt-out across health and social care. Um, is there an impact of this on local government? There's a couple of webinars that um, NHS Digital are doing to sort of explore this in further detail. We don't think actually there probably are many instances around where that happens um, because most of it will be sharing identifiable within a direct care um, or it will be anonymised or um, aggregated um, but worth um, being aware and there'll be some testing around the opt-out model over the next sort of few weeks around that. So is there an expectation that local authorities won't be expected to collect those preferences for opt-out or is it just by the NHS? No, they're going to do it nationally is what I've heard. So online um, NHS Digital will be looking at processes to collect that. So there's not an expectation that that will be collected well, locally. You don't have to say someone's coming to say I don't want you to do this. No. The, the, there is, there is a some, something similar in operation at the moment which goes through the GPs. Yep. I've not been in the detail of this new development, my guess will be a combination of what currently exists. So you're going to do it by your GP, yep. or we may provide a door directly through NHS Digital to do it yep. as well. And a local consent, so if you've already got consent, that will override the opt-out. So if someone's opted out, but you've already got consent, your local, con just to make things even more confu confusing, your, your local consent will override the opt-out. Um, I, so I don't think it would direct, certainly the registrations of opt-out shouldn't um, impact on local authorities. We need to work through, um, I think probably more with public health really, um, uh, what the impact of the opt-out will be. Um, but from early sort of look at it, we don't think there'll be significant impact on the sector. I mean, one of the, one of the drivers for this is, say, the commitment from the Secretary of State 2013 but the other one, it fits in nicely with the GDPR, and this is going to be a real test, is data minimization. So you know, as far as possible, you're de-identifying the data you use. But of course, analysis has got ever more sophisticated, and you can actually do decent analysis on one person. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a fascinating debate stroke evolution of how far is too far and where the boundary lies between what you can do yeah. and what you technically what's technically possible. So again, I, I'm, I'd watch this space. 
but the whole idea behind it is, is as a Secretary of State, to have trust in the way health data is used and, and to be reassured that, you know, if you don't want your identifiers used for anything beyond your direct care, then they won't be. So easy to say, very difficult to implement. So three final quick slides. Um, one, um, just some things to consider. Um, you would have talked about this, heard of this today, um, but around um, identifying um, the legal basis, documenting that, um, uh, and making sure that you meet the consent um, uh, conditions if you do go decide to go down that route. Common law, things to consider. So um, uh, is it, are you, are you, how are you overcoming common law? Are you doing it through informed consent, explicit consent, or another basis? Those three things that we talked about earlier on. Um, and then just obviously be cited around the new data security and protection toolkit. Um, the other thing is also around thinking, for those of you working in social care or with social care, also thinking about providers. So we know that there's a number of local authorities that are providing some training to care providers in their area. Um, um, and also thinking through, um, potentially, they're looking at a smaller cut-down version of the Data Security and Protection Toolkit for small organisations. So um, there's a number of local authorities that are looking through um, whether that's something that can support um, care providers, particularly since they have to meet GDPR. They've also got a new set of uh, key lines of inquiry from the CQC that include stuff around data security as well. So worth having a look at those areas. That's all we wanted to say. Have you got any questions or things that we haven't? I know it's been relatively focused around consent um, and common law, but is there anything else that people wanted to ask, raise, that isn't around that? It is kind of around that, I suppose. It's about the um, common law uh, duty, uh, uh, duty of confidence yep. and consent. It's just we get asked for a lot of examples, so how does that work in example? And yeah. I'm just wondering if... People, there's some guidance coming out from someone to kind of help that because it's quite hard to contextualise this and kind of explain it to people. Yeah. Because I think as information governance professionals, it's quite baffling for us as yeah, well. Yeah. So. Yeah. There are. Um, I don't know whether the GDPR working groups. That's probably more around yeah. GDPR re implementation. Yes. And I think most there's, there's of a the there is a paper being drafted on consent. Yeah. And that's what I mentioned that 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 two test the one we talked about earlier, but not the examples. The only thing I can suggest with the examples is if it's not in the Caldecott 3, which is the one Mark linked to, there was another report done by Dame Fiona Caldecott in 2013, Caldecott 2, the yeah. first one, Caldecott 1 was 1997, but Caldecott 2 is, is pretty commonly available on, on the internet. If you can find that, that's, got, that's, got, that's probably the best source of examples yeah. I can think of. Because no one is responsible for regulating the common law due to confidence, unlike GDPR and data yeah. protection, no one's written any guidance. Says, this is what you need to do. Col Dame Fiona Caldecott and her reports is probably the closest. Yeah, yeah. Caldecott reports worth having a look yeah. at. Um, probably most of the examples in there are probably health based examples, and maybe we do need to do some more that reflect social care and public health. Um, so that may be something we can take away. Um, but yeah, have a look at the Caldecott reports. There are a few examples in the Caldecott 3 as well. Yeah, the yeah, there are. Yeah. There as well. Yeah, and the department's response is worth a read yeah. as well because there's some examples in there. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've recently been re-procuring some public health contracts. Yeah. And some of those are contracts for things that don't seem like healthcare on the surface. So okay. child weight management, yeah. uh, smoking cessation, yeah. things that are lifestyle services. Yeah. So because they're lifestyle services, we can't, we're can't. we having trouble justifying sticking them under uh, for because it's sensitive personal data because it's health information, yep, yep. but health information managed by non-healthcare professionals. So therefore, because they're not often doctors or clinicians doing yep. this, it's just yep. just people doing yep. children. Yep. Uh, so we therefore under Article Nine are finding yep. hard to find a, using the Article Nine Two H or whatever it is yep. yeah, about the uh, for healthcare need. Yep. So therefore, we have to go back to we think do we have to go back to consent for that, and that's really difficult. Oh. And actually, it's. Is there a def I mean, be better definitions around things like public health would be beneficial because actually it makes sense to stick under health, but actually it'd be so not. DCMS were looking at this mm. and this forms part of the derogations. Um, so within one of the derogations is around being clear around what this area covers, and mm. I, there was some email traffic on this um, a while ago with DCMS and with Department of Health and Social Care to define exactly what you've talked about, right. which. 
I'd need to go back and have a look. So if I take your details separately, you can sort of follow up on that for you. Yeah. But I'm pretty certain it's not. It's not just. It's certainly not just restricted to registered and regulated. Sure. Um, it is broader than that. Um, but I can go back yeah. and have a look for it just you. Seems on like that. it's nonsensical that someone would come to someone and receive effectively, give them the healthcare information and yeah. receive he effectively healthcare advice. Yeah. Even if it's something about as simple as weight management. Yeah. And then for that to be treated like an, you know. Yeah. That process. Yeah, I'd need to go back and check in terms of the. I'd need to go back and check in terms of what DCMS and DH were saying. Yeah. Um, but again, they were, again, I think they were tying, trying to tie it through to this bit around duty of confidence. So, not just the registered and regulated, but where would there be a duty of confidence around you know individuals? If, if they tie it to one role or type of role, etc., then that's where you'll see the games being played. Hmm. So, well, it's only that role that's covered. Therefore, yeah. I get my secretary admin support to to ask because they're not covered so it'll be d it'll be designed to cover the situation 